Good afternoon, this is Larry Fortna, and today I'm going to be speaking to you about 3D printers, and more specifically about the DaVinci 1.0 3D printer manufactured by XYZ Printing. If you could hold your questions till the end, I think there'll be ample time to answer them. But before I get started, I would like to tell you a bit about myself as it relates to 3D printing. Uh, because I'm a semi-retired software programmer and I became interested in CNC machines after leaving the corporate world and starting my own company uh, when I ended up working 18-hour days and I decided enough was enough and I took up radio control modeling as a hobby to get away from it all and I started refusing new jobs. So I began using these CNC machines with two-dimensional drawings to create aircraft parts uh, out of foam that I then turned into flying models. But there always seemed to be plastic parts that needed to be purchased to complete the airplanes, so I was making a lot of trips to the hobby shops to buy them. And then one day I discovered an uh, extremely economical 3D printer that can be purchased on a budget such as a retired person like myself can afford. And so for the cost of one or two airplanes, I could get a 3D printer of my own and make my own parts. And I remembered the first time that I saw a 3D printer in operation and it was on a late night TV program where they made a working crescent wrench and you may have seen it. Uh, it was an eye opener to me. But it was obviously out of my price range, and I never really expected to be able to own one. But all of that has changed. I was able to purchase my XYZ printer for under $500. In fact, it was on sale at the time for $399. However, the majority of the 3D printers that you can purchase today are still priced in the range of $1,200 and up. The DaVinci printer just happened to be in the lowest price I could find and, and still is to my knowledge. And most of the 3D printers that you can purchase today are not designed to be aesthetically pleasing, whereby you could have them in your living room like I do with my XYZ printer. But ironically, after getting my 3D printer, I stopped flying radio control aircraft, wouldn't you know it? but I have still found a lot of uses for my 3D printer. Three D printing is not new. In fact, it's been around since the early 1900s. And today it is a highly industrial grade 3D printing process used in the production of real aircraft parts and such that could not be manufactured any other way. Now there are quite a number of different 3D processes. Some uh, use a liquid with infrared lighting and some use powder and lasers and some even use food. But the 3D printer I'm going to discuss today uses ABS plastic filament which is extruded into 3D shapes that you can design with free software. This process is known as freeform fabrication. It is a slow process, but for home use, it works just fine. And for mass production, one could create an object and turn it into a mold, whereby many parts could be created economically. Three D printing with the X Y Z printer works by melting plastic filament that is deposited by a heated extruder, one layer at a time, onto a heated platform, according to three D data that is called G code, that is supplied to the printer via a Windows PC application. Extruders melt the ABS plastic by heating the plastic to roughly 428 degrees Fahrenheit and they deposit the extruded plastic onto a heated glass bed that is then heated to approximately 200 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the plastic comes out of the extruder at about the width of a human hair or a little larger and each layer hardens it is, as it is deposited and bonds to the previous layer. There are two kinds of filaments, one called ABS and one called PLA. And the XYZ printer is only designed to use the ABS filament. But with a few modifications, it can also print PLA, which requires a higher temperature setting. We will talk about those modifications a little later on in the presentation. I borrowed this slide from the internet to show you visually how the 3D process works. It's a simplified drawing, but it gives you an idea of what we're talking about. So let's talk about the hardware. A 3D printer uses stepper motors to move an extruder along the three axes and to advance the filament into the extruder. In order for the plastic to fuse together properly, it requires a heated bed, which is typically heated to around 92 to 94 degrees Celsius or 200 degrees Fahrenheit. The size of the bed is 7 inches by 7 inches or 200 millimeters by 200 millimeters. And the bed raises to accommodate a 7 inch high object. So the largest size of an object that you could print would be 7 inches by 7 inches by 7 inches. There's a control board that converts the G-code to electrical impulses that drive the stepper motors and regulate the temperatures required to extrude the plastic into a 3D object. And of course you can't forget the raw material which in the case of the XYZ printer is ABS filament. This is what uh, typical stepper motor looks like when it's uh, disassembled. And these stepper motors uh, are used to move the extruder along a path. And they're specialized motors that can rotate a shaft in very precise degrees of rotation. And they have very high torque characteristics. So they can hold a part in position uh, and then they can move it in very fine increments. The XYZ printer uses four of these stepper motors. One is used to control the X axis. One is used to control the Y axis. And one is used to raise and lower the heated bed on the Z axis. While the fourth and final stepper motor is used to push the filament through the extruder. We will see those stepper motors in operation in a video a little later in this presentation. The heated bed consists of a layer of glass on top and a heating element under the glass. And this whole platform is then spring loaded in the event that the extruder should meet some type of resistance when it is unexpected. We generally apply a layer of glue from a glue stick on the glass surface to help the first layer of plastic adhere well to the glass. There are also some expensive Captain tapes that can be used and these tapes can cost around $50 so I prefer to use cheap glue stick. If you do use the glue stick it's a good idea to clean it from the glass periodically to ensure that there's a clean adhesion of the plastic to the glass surface. And some glue sticks work better than others as I have found. And I find that the Elmer's Craft Bond glue stick works best and it can be cleaned from the glass surface with 
rubbing alcohol. And while we're talking about the heated bed, I should mention the tools that I use to remove the plastic once it has hardened. The best way to remove the plastic is to allow the bed to cool, at which point the plastic will separate from the glass on its own. But sometimes I get a little impatient and I don't want to wait that long. So I use a razor blade scraper to pop the part from the glass. The XYZ printer comes with a plastic spreader that is used to separate the parts from the glass, but it can't get under those parts nearly as well as a razor blade. <clears throat> this slide depicts a typical extruder, although the extruder on the XYZ printer is not exactly like this one. It does work in the same manner. Uh, the basic idea is to take a 1.75 millimeter plastic filament and reduce it to about four tenths of a millimeter or less in diameter by melting the plastic and forcing it out of the extruder opening. Now, the only weakness that I have discovered with my XYZ printer is the connector that connects the extruder to the control board. The extruder draws quite a bit of current, and the flimsy connector that they used has a tendency to fail. And when it does, the plastic stops flowing, and you will have wasted a bit of filament and maybe possibly a lot of time. So, reaching into my model airplane box, parts, I found myself a connector that is capable of handling a large current flow. And I cut off the old connector and replaced it with this better one. Problem solved. Like inkjet printers on the market today, the XYZ Printer Company sells the printer for a low price and makes it up on the other end when they have you purchase filament for it. The printer comes supplied with a cartridge that contains an EEEPROM uh, that stores the amount of filament left in the cartridge, and the EEPROM tells the controller when it is running low on filament and it can pause the extrusion process if it runs out of filament during the print. The cartridge itself is about a third of the cost more than that of ABS filament on a two pound spool and it does not contain as much filament as you would get on a typical two pound spool that sells for under $20. So enterprising hackers have figured out how to reprogram the EEPROM in the cartridge to restore it to the full cartridge setting. So this allows you to purchase standard two pound spools and use them in place of the cartridge filament. So then you can purchase a 3D printed cartridge resetter that is battery operated and will reset your filament cartridge by simply inserting it into the bottom of the cartridge and pressing a button for about five seconds. So one of the first projects that you'll probably want to print with your 3D printer when it arrives is an ABS filament spool holder that fits on the back of your printer. There are many ready-made STL files just for this on the internet. And this assumes, of course, that you're going to hack your XYZ printer. As to the software, the XYZ printer does not come with any software other than the software that creates G-code from an STL file 
and sends it to the 3D printer. G-code is machine language that the machine understands and STL files are called stereolithography files uh, that are 3D representations of an object. So this program only runs on a Windows operating system and I have a Mac PC, but I can still run it from a virtual operating system such as Parallels Desktop. So these STL files, the, they're also called stereolithography. They're created uh, by a 3D rendering program such as SketchUp or AutoCAD programs, which we'll talk about in more detail shortly. But if you're going to hack your 3D printer by resetting the cartridge filament to use standard ABS spools, then you may be interested in finding an alternate XYZ printer application which has been modified to accept G-code, which is the standard machine code that is used in all types of 3D printers and CNC machines. And a Google search can quickly locate such an application. So I think if you would search for using non-crappy software with a DaVinci printer, you might find what you're looking for. Now, combined with the filament cartridge hack, the XYZ printer can now be used with standard off-the-shelf design software, such as Autodesk or SketchUp, to produce a more controlled set of G-code than provided by the supplied XYZ printer application itself, which only accepts STL files. And once you have created a 3D object and have your STL file format in hand, you'll want a good quality slicer, such as Kiss Slicer or Slice 3R, to round out your software. And you also may need to clean up the STL files using another software tool called NetFab, N-E-T-F-A-B-B, -B, all of which you can download from the internet for free. Now, I should mention that even if you have no 3D skills whatsoever, you can still find many ready-made projects to print on your 3D printer. There is a website called thingverse.com that has hundreds if not thousands of projects available for printing for free. I actually spent two hours one day scrolling through all of the different projects and I never reached the end. So, even if you do not own a 3D printer, you can still design your own 3D object and have it printed by someone who does own a 3D printer. And there are websites available that will allow you to list your 3D printer and let folks bid on your services if you want to print objects for profit. Look up 3dhubs.com if you wish to register your 3D printer services. And if you have designed a 3D object that you would like to have 3D printed on, say, some different material and maybe on a better quality 3D printer than you own, there is a website called shapeways.com in which you can submit a 3D object for printing in any type of material that you can afford. I say that because I once printed a 3D bust of myself that I scanned with some hardware that we'll talk about later to see just how much it would cost to have it printed in other materials. For approximately $7, I can have it printed in ABS plastic. But if I wanted it printed in, let's say, gold, for instance, it would cost me roughly $7,000. And if I wanted it printed in platinum, I can have it for $17,000.
So the bottom line is that the tools I'm going to show you shortly can be used whether or not you own a 3D printer. <clears throat> I should also mention another piece of hardware that can be used to scan an object and convert it into a 3D image using an old Xbox 360 Connect camera and some software called ScanEct. This is the hardware that I use to scan a bust of myself and you can pick up a Connect camera for around $80 or less and maybe another 130 or so for the ScanEct software to be able to capture and convert the scan into an STL file. And is there a program for Nix that makes STL? For Unix that makes STL? I am not aware of that. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't. There may be. Okay, so um, let's put this all together. Now that you know a little bit more about the 3D printer and the software that drives it. In the videos that are going to follow this slide, I'm going to show you how to design a 3D domino holder for a game that I invented. And I'm going to use Google SketchUp to design it from scratch. And then I'm going to export that SketchUp file into an STL file. And this will require an add-on or a, a plug-in, as they call it, to SketchUp, which can be obtained from the Internet, again, for free. And once we've obtained an STL file, we can then convert that to G-code and then load the G-code into the hacked XYZ printer software and print the object. And even if you've not hacked your printer software, you can still use the SCL file. You just can't control the quality of the print as nicely. Now, SketchUp is a software program created by Google. And it's now known, I believe, as Sketchucation. And there are quite a few versions of SketchUp that are available uh, for downloading if you want to use an older version. Because the newer versions have a different method of installing add-ons. And speaking of which, you'll need an add-on to be able to save the 3D object to an STL file format. And these add-ons are free, but basically they add some of the features to the free version of SketchUp that you would otherwise only find in the paid version. Now, SketchUp is by no means the only program in which to create 3D objects. Autodesk makes another 3D, uh, another free program available to create 3D objects, and it's called Autodesk 123D. Uh, but I've used SketchUp for many years designing two-dimensional objects and it was quite simple to change a two-dimensional object into a three-dimensional object using SketchUp as you'll see when we go through that process next. So Huey, if you could start the slide. Thank you. Um, this is the two-dimensional object, and I'm going to select a tool from the uh, left side here called a push-pull tool. And this will allow me to pull that two-dimensional object into three dimensions. It gives height to the object. And and now I am uh, I'm pulling up the, the bottom portion of the uh, 
domino holder here. And this one particular um, area that didn't turn white, it kind of got me baffled. I didn't quite understand why it was doing that. Uh, so I kind of moved my mouse around a bit trying to figure that out. Um, but essentially, uh, when they change colors to white, uh, they're more apt to come out properly when you export it to STL. So if the faces, which is what these are called, are reversed, um, it's possible your 3D object will require some touching up with NetFab. So again, I'm going back to this one piece that didn't quite like me. And I'm trying to figure out what to do about it. So I decided I would erase it, and that was probably not a good thing to do. But I'll go to the bottom side here and see if I can recreate it. There was an operation there called Make Faces. But again, it reversed the faces. So now I'm going to put it back to the right color. And now you can see that the part is placed at the top. So uh, I didn't really want that either. So we go back to the push-pull tool. And I can drag it over to another one that's the height that I like it. And it will assume that depth. So now we have all the faces with the correct color. And this tool here is uh, called a tape measure. And what I'm doing is I'm putting some guidelines on the object because I want to make this these I want to make these slots slanted. And as I move them, I want them to snap into place. And SketchUp is very good about using snap to make sure things go where you want them to go. So by simply selecting this one outline, I can now just drag it up to my guideline. And I'm going to do each one of those. And what we are accomplishing by doing this is we are putting a 30 degree angle or so into this domino holder so that when the domino is placed in the tray, it's viewable to the user. And I think we're now going to use the orbit tool to move the object around so we can see just exactly what it looks like. And this is x-ray mode that we are putting into place now so that we can look through the image and see exactly how it's going to look on the inside. And then we just orbit around so that we can look at it from all different directions. Turning x-ray off, we're now going to select a tool that can round the edges for us and so that they won't be so uh, hard and uh, this will smooth everything out. And there we have it with one operation. We Again, this is another plugin that you need to get for SketchUp. It doesn't come uh, native. It's called Rounded Corners. Um, does not come with SketchUp. You have to add the plugin. And there are thousands and thousands of plugins available for SketchUp. You can make it do whatever you like. Um, so this is pretty much what I was looking for. Um, and I think at this point we can drop back to the presentation on the PowerPoint.
Now, uh, now that you have an SDL file, uh, the next step would be to slice it into G-code. And that can then be loaded into your hacked XYZ printer executable. And so in the next video, I'm going to demonstrate using a, a slicer program called SLIC3R. It's a funny way of saying slicer, um, but there's another popular slicer out there. It's a free one also that's called KISS Slicer. slicer. Keep it simple, slicer. Um, and both of these do a, a, a fine job of slicing that 3D object into layers, which the 3D printer can then uh, handle and print. So if we would start that uh, video now. Uh, I may stop this one here because I went pretty quickly through this. What I'm doing here is selecting that STL file that, uh, that I created in SketchUp. And there are four tabs down here at the, the bottom, uh, which allow you to view the object in 3D or two dimensions, or you can preview it, uh, which we'll show you in a minute. And we can show you the layers as they are formed. Um, you can also, up in the upper right hand side, you can change the print settings and the filament and change different printers. And this is where you would either export the STL, uh, in case you've cleaned it up some, uh, or export it as G-code to be used in a uh, hacked 3D version of the printer software. All right, we go back here to the 3D uh, view, and, and then I'll go to the preview view. In the preview view here, um, we're looking at the very top layer, and it kind of gives you a rough visual estimation of what it's going to look like when the layers are formed on the 3D printer. These areas uh, around the outside of those slots are called perimeters. Uh, and you can define the number of perimeters that you wish your 3D object to have. And I believe this one is set for two perimeters. And we can just kind of rotate this around and get a look at it from a different viewpoints. And then I'm going to select layers. This little slide bar on the right hand side allows us to look at the layers starting the very first layer all the way up to the very last topmost layer. So we can get an idea of exactly what our object is going to look like when it's uh, being processed on the 3D printer. Now, here we are at an area uh, where we're using what's called infill. These little uh, hexagon shapes here fill in the, uh, the plastic area so that the uh, plastic can be formed over the top of it and not cave in when we get to the top layer. So it doesn't have to be a solid object. It just has to have some sort of support. And that's what infill provides. So we're just going on up through the layers, getting towards the middle part now where we start actually seeing the slots uh, up here. And we'll just continue to move the slider on up until we get to towards the top. And that's our top layer. Going back to the preview mode, you can do the same thing.
Now, if we go to the print settings, we have an area called layers and perimeters, and this allows you to define the layer height of the extruded material. So uh, 0.25 millimeters is what this object was selected for. So the smaller this value, the longer the print will take. And again, I've set up two perimeters. And you can have as many as you like, but that's the minimum. And I've set it to have at least three top and bottom solid layers. When we go to the infill operation, we find that I've set this one to 15% density. And I've used a honeycomb pattern for the uh, fill pattern. And the top and bottom fill is a rectangular pattern. And we can also apply a, a skirt and a brim. Uh, this, the skirt, which I've set for one loop, allows you to get the material flowing before it actually starts creating the 3D object. And I can set the distance from the object, in this case, six millimeters. Some objects uh, may require supports, and this one did not but you can set up your support parameters here. And you can also then set up the speed at which different portions of the print take place. So perimeters uh, are set to run at 35 millimeters per second and small perimeters at 20 and external perimeters is 70% of the full value. And uh, so now we're going back to the platter, and we're going to export the G-code. And... I believe that completes that uh, particular s slide presentation, Huey. In this next video, I'm going to show you uh, an, an actual DaVinci One XYZ printer going through the startup phase of preparing to print a 3D object. And you may wonder what the difference is between a 1.0 printer and a 2.0. Uh, the, and the difference is the number of extruders. The 1.0 version only has one and cannot print multiple colors, whereas the 2.0 version can and sells for a, about $100 more. So let's go ahead and start that. And uh, this particular um, screen opening here is showing that the extruder is heating and it needs to go up to about 220 degrees centigrade and the platform needs to reach 90 degrees centigrade before it's going to start printing. And once it does start printing, it's going to try to clean the extruder. So we'll watch that happen next. Okay, we've reached our temperature. And now the printhead is being, the extruder rather, is being cleaned. And it now positions the extruder over the bed and waits for the temperatures to get back up to temperature before it will start laying down the uh, plastic.
This particular object was a keychain. And that first layer of plastic was just the uh, the area that we're laying down to get before we get started. The actual object is now laying down the perimeter. And I see we're running a little bit out of time. I'm going to, Huey, go on and continue out of this. Um, there are some more things I would like to talk about. I um, probably won't have time. Um, but anyhow, once you have, uh, uh, let's get into the post-production here. Um, I'll skip the next one. So, um, now that you've printed your 3D part, you'll notice it may have a lot of ridges in it. And the larger the diameter of the printed layer, the more defined those ridges will be. And so there's a trade-off between smoother ridges and the amount of time that it takes to print the object. And smoother prints take longer to produce. And so we can apply some post-processing to the 3D object by allowing it to soak in acetone vapor bath. And this will smooth out the ridges but it will also reduce the details in the 3D printer somewhat, print somewhat. So some folks like to heat the vapor, and that will shorten the time it takes to smooth out the object, but it's also more dangerous. So I prefer to use a cold vapor bath, which can take about an hour or more to smooth it out. And you need to be careful with it and keep an eye on it from time to time, because if it's left too long, it's going to melt into a plastic puddle. And so I buy some plastic containers at Lowe's that are similar to Tupperware, and that type of plastic is not affected by acetone. And I can then place a paper towel in the bottom of the container and soak it with the acetone and then place aluminum foil on top of that to keep the plastic from touching the acetone directly. And then I cover the container and let it set for about 30 minutes and check it every 10 minutes or so till I peel the object is about as smooth as it needs to be, but it will continue to smooth out even after it's taken out of the vapor bath. So it takes a little experimenting to learn just when is the best time to pull the part from the vapor. Um, now, I have made a great deal of objects with my 3D printer, but one of the things that came out very well was a game board that is comprised of multiple pieces of plastic printed on the 3D printer and then glued together using PVC cement that you can purchase at the hardware store. Uh, this allows you to create a, create a much larger object that can be, that can be printed uh, in a single print on your 3D printer. So this particular game board is called Fast Track. It contains 157 magnets and each magnet has a printed 3D printed magnet holder that was glued into position either on the game board or on the player pieces themselves. And the railroad track was made out of about eight individual pieces uh, that were then glued together. Now everyone loves playing on this board because the playing pieces snap into place. And it took me nearly a week to print all of the pieces and but it's a one-of-a-kind board that I'm very proud of, and, and I couldn't have made it without the assistance of a 3D printer. Now, I can't begin to show you all the things I've made, but there's just a real small sampling of things. I, I've made dozens of cookie cutters, and which are not showing, in addition to wiring trays and LED lighting fixtures and you know even the business card and an umbrella holder for my charcoal grill. So there's really no limit to what you can do. It's just your imagination and, of course, the size of the, the, uh, the print bed was about your only restrictions. And there's a question over here I see that, um, can you use multiple colors to print the object with multiple filaments? And the answer is not with the 1.0 
DaVinci printer. Um, but the 2.0 will allow you to print two colors. Uh, but what I do is a lot of times I will paint the object with, uh, if you remember, if you're my age bracket, you might remember Tester's model paints. Um, the little euchre cube there in the center is, uh, that, that was printed with Tester's paints. And uh, the bust of myself was also painted with that. Uh, the other objects on here uh, were printed with the different colors of ABS plastic, uh, except for the little uh, cube uh, that has the LR and dot on it. And for that, I indented the, the um, plastic so that I could insert some vinyl uh, lettering that I cut on a... Uh, a Graftech uh, final cutter. So you can do a lot of different things um, to liven up your 3D print. Um, the one object up there in the upper left corner is uh, a, an object that allowed you to put a, uh, a, a microscope on, on an iPhone and be able to um, use it to zoom in on a thread and see what it looks like, for example. And then there's a uh, business card holder, which you can tack up on a uh, cork board. Um, and lots of things like that. And so is the printer, so it is printer dependent, yes. Um, the, uh, there are other 3D printers out there besides this one that can do the multiple colors, um, they're not as inexpensive as this one. I focused on the XYZ printer because of its cost. Um, on sale, uh, I've seen them just recently at uh, 449 says, very interesting. I wish technology could create a few more um, something in the week to play with all the stuff. And uh, Leah says uh, she wished technology could create a few more days in the week to play with all the stuff. Amen to that. Uh, even being retired, I don't have enough time for all of my hobbies and things that I like to do. So if we could 3D print some time, that would be excellent. So uh, that concludes uh, my presentation. I want to thank everyone for watching. Uh, again, if if you have any questions, uh, now would be the time to ask them. And again, my name is Larry Fortna, and my email address is LarryFortna at gmail.com. If you think of something that you would uh, like to ask about, feel free to email me, um, and I would be more than happy to try to answer your questions. <laughs>